Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation. The goal of the Sounds True Foundation is to provide access and eliminate financial barriers to transformational education and resources, such as teachings and trainings on mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion. If you'd like to learn more and join with us in our efforts, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, my guest is Dawson Church. Dawson is an award-winning science writer with three best-selling books to his credit. He's a prolific researcher on how to apply the breakthroughs of energy psychology to health and personal performance. Also, dozens of his studies have been published in peer-reviewed journals. With Sounds True, Dawson Church is the creator of a new audio learning series. It's called Healing the Roots of Trauma, Emotional Freedom Technique for Recovery and Resilience. I have to say that I am floored by the research that Dawson has done, the studies that he's done, and the results that he's found from the effectiveness of EFT in the field. Take a listen. Dawson, you and I are connecting here for the first time after something like two decades. And I remember meeting you 20 plus years ago at some kind of publishing event. You're in the publishing world, I'm in the publishing world. And here you are, a sounds true author, creator of this new audio <laughs> series on the emotional freedom technique. So bring me up to date. What was your personal journey moving from being in the publishing business to now being a writer, researcher, and teacher of the emotional freedom technique? Yeah, and that was a Book Expo America, Tammy, many, many years ago. And it was a wonderful experience meeting in publishing because in publishing, as you know, we get to meet the most fabulous people who are authors, and then we play a role in getting their ideas out to the world. And I loved doing that. But then in 1997, I retired and I wound up buying a small hotel and being a bed and breakfast owner for a while. And Tammy, it was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> it was so boring. You know, it just wasn't me. So I got back into it. I also recognized that this burgeoning field of energy psychology was really growing. So I started Energy Psychology Press, and it's the intersection of the energy work, energy medicine work that all these wonderful healers do, and also psychology and the ability to shift. PTSD, anxiety, depression, phobias, other psychological types of disorders. And I realized there was a big opportunity there. So I began the publishing company just in time after 10 years to see that the world was going away from books and toward online sorts of media. So I then made the switch, began to offer online courses. And now we do do a few books and hardly anyone that knows what those are anymore. They have their pages inside, they have covers, things like that. <laughs> But we're mostly doing online courses. And so now we can reach people also in all the time zones of the world. We have such a big reach doing that. And I love that about this work. And I also became, I moved to having from being a, an observer and a facilitator. As a publisher, I wanted to get these, these ideas out there. And after a while, I realized that people are suffering. People are suffering psychologically. They're suffering medically. And energy therapies can make an enormous difference. And when we look at the research into how large the effects are of energy treatment, we realize the potential of these therapies. And so I switched from being a publisher to being an author and a real advocate for these, these therapies. Eventually, I was able to help get them into the Veterans Administration. They're in Kaiser Permanente. They're in a lot of hospital systems. They're in Johns Hopkins. They're in Cleveland Clinic. And so I really want to see these therapies in primary care. And that's my, my current focus. Mm -hmm. Now, you yourself have done quite a bit of research on the effectiveness specifically of the energy therapy, the energy freedom technique. Can you explain, just introduce people who are not familiar to EFT, and then what kinds of studies you've done and the results that you're seeing? 
I remember the very first time I used EFT myself, and I was a Gestalt therapy advocate at the time. And this ther therapy, this therapist friend of mine said, "Dawson, I'm working with Vietnam veterans. I'm working with people having sports performance and anxiety, and I'm working with these this variety of clients." And we're using this technique where they tap with their fingertips on acupuncture points. Tammy, I thought I'd never heard anything more ridiculous in my life. Tapping on acupuncture points can help with psychotherapy. And so I didn't really have much faith in the idea. And I, in fact, I took the instruction manual he gave me and threw it in a big pile of papers and forgot all about it. Until a few months later, I had a really difficult moment in my own life when I was trying to sell a business and the sale was collapsing and I got really anxious. And at that moment, mysteriously, that instruction sheet surfaced at the top of my slush pile and I sat down on the steps of my office and I tapped. And my anxiety dropped by half a lot. And then I began to pay attention to it. Then other psychotherapist friends began saying, I'm not just treating people, Westerners, I'm not just, just, just treating Westerners for anxiety. I just got back from Rwanda and I'm treating people whose parents were killed in the genocide there and tapping is releasing those PTSD symptoms like flashbacks and nightmares. Then I really paid attention when I heard about Vietnam veterans and uh, Haitian orphans and a variety of people with severe chronic stressful events in their life that were, were being affected by it. So I dove into research and research quantifies things. I wanna know not just that you got better, I wanna know on average of this group of people by how much you got better. And then we compare that, for example, to psychopharmacology and traditional talk therapy. And the results of, of EFT that we began to measure in these studies were immense. And so I got further and further into it. In my very first study, published in 2010 in a medical journal called Integrative Medicine, a very respected journal. We showed that one day of tapping, one day of tapping, and we were using the tapping with healthcare workers like doctors and nurses and chiropractors, a single day of tapping dropped their levels of anxiety and depression by 45%. Their cravings for things like cake and chocolate and cookies and alcohol and all these other things dropped off tapping in a single session by 83%. So we were getting these massive, massive results. And I then said, we absolutely have to get these therapies into primary care. We had to do research on them. And now we have just literally, we estimate there are over 30 million people tapping in the world. It's very simple. You just think about something that's bad, something that troubles you. Could be a, uh, a personal event, could be a childhood event, current event, could be a really old event that you think of about something that, that bothers you and you really focus on it intently. What that does is it lights up all of the stress circuits of the brain, especially the midbrain or limbic system. And so now you have, and, 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 and it sounds true, there are a lot of authors, wonderful authors who talk about the limbic system and the arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. People like Stephen Porges and Stephen Levine talk about this. And we know from a lot of research that when you're stressed, those parts of the brain are highly active. You have a highly active limbic system, and we can read those signatures on an M MRI. We can see on the MRI that you are highly stressed. We then notice as we have people tap and just stimulate these 14 acupuncture meridians, we see rapid deactivation of that. If they were dealing with a craving, the craving goes way down. If they were thinking about a child of memory, their limbic activation drops remarkably in only a couple of minutes. So it's acting on the information flows in the brain. And when your limbic system, your limbic whole lim limbic structure is then deactivated and it's no longer sending signals of fight or flight through the amygdala into the peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system, you get much calmer. And then, for example, that veteran who was sharing about the, the death of his friend in a roadside explosion in Iraq. And is 10 out of 10 for emotion. His limbic brain is all lit up as he recalls that stressful event. After only a few minutes of tapping, typically those levels of triggering will go way down. He remembers the event clearly still and the death of his friend in combat. And he now remembers it without that strong activation of the fear response. And that's a typical scenario with EFT. 
Okay, Dawson. So you said when you were first introduced, you threw the piece of paper away and rolled your eyes. <laughs> and it seems like there are still a lot of people in the mainstream culture who are like, come on, this is, you know, it's, if it sounds too good to be true, it's not kind of thing. And, you know, it's only, you're only talking about one day and you're getting a 45% reduction in anxiety and depression. We would all know about this. It would be in the news. It wouldn't be in these, you know, semi-narrow or esoteric platforms like a podcast, like Insights at the Edge. So what's the gap between the effectiveness of EFT and its mainstream adoption? How do you understand that? Actually, it's very widespread in primary care and in the mainstream. We have there are tens of millions of people using it. I've had a, a free manual, a mini manual on my website for over a decade, and over 3 million people have downloaded that, so it's had a lot of attention that way. If you go on to the U.S. government's uh, website, pubmed.gov, which reports clinical trials in top-level journals, you'll find dozens of studies of EFT there. You'll also find practice guidelines developed by Kaiser Permanente, a large hospital chain. You'll find other practice guidelines for the Veterans Administration. It's, it's been approved by the VA. It's in use by the VA. So uh, it's working its way into primary care. But tell me, the main obstacle actually is not uh, skepticism or disbelief. It's really our fundamental Western approach of believing that material reality is the primary reality and thinking that energy and consciousness and awareness is just something vague and ephemeral. And what I show in my books, like I have a book called Mind to Matter, where I literally look at all the research showing how our brains transceive signals and then turn that into what we think of as material reality. When our consciousness changes, a very simple example of consciousness change and molecular change is when I think a stressful thought, when I get upset, when I go into fight or flight, my body produces cortisol, much more cortisol. Cortisol rises. I'm literally producing a molecule, cortisol, using a thought. With EFT, we find that cortisol drops in one of my studies on PubMed.gov. In one week, people's baseline levels of that stress hormone cortisol drop drop. Uh, 37%. So big drops in physical things as a result of changes in awareness, consciousness, fear, emotion, all these intangibles, but they're having a huge effect on our body. So it is working its way into mainstream medicine. It's in wide use in private therapy. Uh, one study found that about 42% of therapists are using some form of energy therapy, usually EFT. It's also now starting to be applied for other things. But our culture is so oriented to give me the pill, give me the surgery, give me the, 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 the external agent to go into my body. And we're so not oriented looking at energy. But if you change your energy, you change the molecules your body is producing, and very, very quickly, you can shift all kinds of, we find, for example, that high stress leads the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which I know you've covered on previous podcasts, uh, that show that people who have unresolved trauma have much higher levels of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, suicide attempts, smoking, hepatitis, and on and on and on. So unresolved trauma, emotional trauma, emotions are literally driving disease. When you release emotion, when you drop cortisol, when you have much lower levels of all those stress hormones and brain waves, then your body thrives. And so it is working its way into a surprising number of medical and psychological treatment centers. Do you have a vision of where EFT is going to be in a de in a decade? <laughs> it's funny. I was I was walking through MD Anderson Cancer Center, and MD Anderson is regarded as probably the most advanced ca cancer treatment set of hospitals in the U.S. And um, <clears throat> I was walking there there through there with a nurse friend of mine who does EFT with cancer patients and with staff there, especially staff staff uh, nurses, doctors other hospital workers are already stressed. So there's a big, people go, go to chemotherapy there, and there's a big recovery room at MD Anderson in Orlando, Florida for um, 
them to be in to stabilize after chemotherapy. And it's a glass fronted room so that the nurses can walk past, look at it, and make sure if anyone is having a serious ab reaction, they can intervene. So I walked past there with my friend, Pat, and she said, Dawson, my vision for the future is that one day we'll look in through this glass and we'll see a patient tapping, doing EFT. And I said to her, Pat, that's not my vision at all. My vision is one day soon, we walk past this room, look in through the glass and see that there's a patient not tapping. And we'll wonder why. <laughs> so I expect it to spread really widely. It is spreading widely right now. And these therapies are so good that they're going to become part of primary care, part of pain management, part of physiological issues and, and, and psychological issues. So they are gaining ground, but they need to be part of this whole paradigm shift we're in the middle of, of realizing that energy and consciousness and awareness has dramatic effects at the level of the physical body. Mm -hmm. What's the history of tapping? Who first came up with this notion and the actual protocol? I mean, you start by saying to yourself as you're tapping, I deeply and completely accept myself. I found that really interesting, really powerful, but I'd love to know more how this particular protocol that you teach came into being. Well, the idea of self-acceptance is really powerful. Carl Jung said a century ago that self-acceptance is the primary marker of the material psyche. So Carl, Carl Rogers said that every journey in healing begins with accepting myself the way I am. So that's a fundamental precept of psychology for more than a century. Self-acceptance is, is really important. And then tapping itself comes from Qigong, and that goes back thousands and thousands of years. I've been tapping with Qigong masters now for 20 years. It's wonderful to realize that they, they, they've been incorporating tapping for, for centuries. And then when uh, during, during President Nixon's trip to China in 1972, one of his advisors witnessed a, uh, an operation done, surgery done only with ear acupuncture for pain. And that then began the whole cycle of the acceptance of acupuncture in the US. Also shiatsu acupressure, pressure on acupressure points, which is tapping or simply hard pressure on the various points. So it's been around for a long, long time. A psychologist called Roger Callahan began to experiment with his, his clients in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And he worked with one client in particular, and he tried everything with her, he tried all kinds of things. She had a phobia of water. Her name was Mary. She couldn't take immerse herself in water. She was afraid whenever she was around water. He had a swimming pool and he treated people at his house and she couldn't go within 20 feet of the pool. She was terrified she'd have a panic attack if she got that close to a body of water. And after trying every single therapy he had, he read about acupressure. And one day he just leaned over and tapped gently on her stomach meridian, which he knew was associated with fear, which is right under the pupil of her eye. And so he tapped on her there, just wondering if that might make a difference. That night she phoned him and said, my fear of water is gone. He didn't believe her, had her over the next day. She walked right up to the pool and stuck her feet in and her, her the cure was permanent. She never got a fear of water. He then wrote a book called The Five-Minute Phobia Cure, which was published in 1985. His students took, uh, took tapping further. So it's an ancient technique, but it's been systematized now. And EFT just uses a really simple form of tapping, but one again, that's now been proven in over 100 clinical trials. Can you talk me through the method and the import, how each step <laughs> of the method is effective, how it works? I can walk you through it. Now, I have to warn you, Tammy, do you know who Lisa Gar is? Lisa Gar? Lisa? Anyway, wait, okay. She asked me on my first interview with her, and... This is live on the air, big audience, and she she broke down crying, and we had to interrupt. interrupt I'm, I'm all right. I'm gonna be. I'm prepared yeah. for this. Let, let's go. <laughs> With that disclaimer in place, <laughs> so you you do that, and also every person listening now, I'd like you to think of an event in your life within the last two weeks that troubled you emotionally. 
So something that bothered you, you could have had a wait in line, you could have had a tense conversation with a coworker or a family member. So something in your life in the last couple of weeks that affected you personally and directly and where you have an emotional response to that. So think of something like that that happened in the recent past. Don't go back to your childhood. It's too triggering. It has to be within the last two weeks. So Tani, what? What just a couple of words of an annoying thing or a triggering thing that happened to you very recently? Uh, I'm going to pick a, a pretty um, low lift one, which is my dogs are getting groomed upstairs and they whine and they bark and they howl and they're upset. And when they're upset like that, it upsets me. And I, okay. I my nervous system gets all jambled up when I hear them whining and howling and crying. Yeah. Entrainment. So think about your dogs being groomed upstairs and then tune into yourself, your body right now. What number are you on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of that triggering? Zero being no triggering, 10 being the maximum triggering. Well, I told you I'd pick something pretty mild. So I'm only really a four at this moment, especially because they're quiet at the moment. Okay, good. So they aren't making a lot of noise right at this very moment and you're a four. And now we'll just go through the routine. And if you're listening, please do. Get your issue, give it a really brief title like Dogs Being Groomed, and then I'll describe to you which points to tap on to shift your energy. So you've got your number now, zero through 10. You've got your event, you've got your brief phrase. Now, all we do is we incorporate that in a statement of self-acceptance while tapping on a meridian, and this meridian is on the side of your hand. So if you just look at the joint that anchors your little finger, then tap with three fingers on the other hand on that point, and either you can say out loud or silently, and I think time you do it silently, even though I'm remembering this issue, and Tan, you can say the dog's being groomed in your mind, Really tune into the dogs being groomed, sound of the whining. I deeply and completely accept myself. Keep tapping, notice your breathing, make sure you're breathing deeply. Even though I remember this emotionally triggering event, and then Tammy, you'll say, in your mind, the name of your event. You'll really tune into the sounds of those dogs being groomed. And if you're listening to us, tune in and use the name of your event. I deeply and completely accept myself. One more time. Even though I remember this emotionally triggering event, name of your event, I am breathing now. Notice your breathing. And I accept myself just the way I am. Now tap on the top of your head. Right on the top of your head, that's good. Yeah, keep your eyes open. Eyes open, there's a lot of scientific theory behind this. I won't explain it all now. I have whole books on that. So we'll let that go. So tap the top of your head. And again, really tune into that, that triggering event. Your number whatever your number is, the event, remember it vividly. Now tap where your eyebrow meets the bridge of your nose with two fingers. So two fingers tapping where your eyebrow meets the bridge of your nose. Notice your breath and say either out loud or silently the name of your emotionally triggering event. Notice your breath again. Now tap on the side of your eye, right on the edge of your eye socket, in line with the very edge of your eye, and say the name of your event again. And again, vividly recall the specifics. So Tammy, keep your eyes open, and vividly recall the sound of that whining, other noises they're making, how long it went on, how intense it was, its volume, which dog was whining the most, that dog. <laughs> yeah. Now tap under the pupil of your eye with two fingers. 
really focusing on your event. This is your stomach meridian, the one that Roger Callahan tapped on with Mary with her fear of water. And really tune into your event. Let your mind be filled with your event and the recollection of your event. Tapping onto your eye. Now tap onto your nose. That's your governing meridian end point. Good, keeping your eyes open, feeling your breath, all the details of the event. Now tap on your chin, on your lower lip. This is your central meridian you're stimulating now. Feeling your breath, remembering that event, all the details of the event that bothered you within the last couple of weeks. And then tap where your collarbone meets your breastbone with three or four fingers on either side, feeling your breath, tuning into the event. And then just, just reach onto your arm and tap about level with your elbow on the side of your body. It's your spleen meridian. Tune into the event as you stimulate your acupressure points. And then one more time on the side of your hand. And then tap one more location, which is the back of your hand between the bones that anchor your little finger and your ring finger. So the back of your hand between those big long bones that anchor your little finger and your ring finger. And now, We'll do a quick exercise that stimulates the production of calming brain waves. So first of all, keep your head steady and look all the way down. Keep your head steady, look all the way up. Imagine you're looking at a giant clock and you're looking at 12 o'clock as you think about the event that annoyed you. Now look at three o'clock. Keeping your head steady, look all the way to the side, to the right at three o'clock. Now look all the way to the left at nine o'clock. Keeping your head steady, look all the way down at six o'clock again, the other floor. Look all the way up at 12 o'clock. Feel your breath as you think about the annoying event. And then stop tapping and relax. Relax completely, feel your breath. And now think about the event again, like you did exactly, let's see, six minutes ago, and see what your new number is. How triggered are you on a scale of zero to 10? So tell me, for your dogs, that sound of them whining. What's your number now? You're smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to give it a one and a half. And you know, <laughs> Doss and I intentionally chose something um, that wasn't a, a big deal event. And of course, I'd like to try this again with some things in my life that are more big deal events. But uh, thank you for taking us through that. It does bring up a bunch of questions for me. First is, you know, I had a tendency I wanted to shut my eyes. Why keep the eyes open? because we used to think that memories were static, like pulling a photograph out of an album, looking at the memory and dropping it back in the album. We now know that when we pull memories into our awareness, we actually modify them. And we modify them by combining those memories, those images, those sensory experiences with information from the present moment. And the present moment contains safe information. So when we pull up a troubling, piece of information from the past and pair it with a neutral piece of information or a pleasant stimulus now, just like, for example, tapping or telling it to a friend or sharing it with a therapist. Now we're combining those two memories. The way the brain works now is it's putting that, that photograph back on the album with these positive or neutral emotional tags, which reduces the number. And it only happens if you, it happens more if you have your, your eyes open than if you have your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And this whole notion of actually bringing forward, bringing up the traumatic event. I mean, I've heard it say that that can be re-traumatizing, yet in this approach that you're offering here with EFT, we're intentionally bringing up the memory. So talk to me about that and what in the technique 
safeguards that it's not re-traumatizing. Yeah, re-traumatization was coined by a therapist called Charles Figley in the 1980s. And um, it, the idea was first noticed strongly by another psychiatrist called Joseph Volpe after World War II. And he was a famous psychiatrist and he was tasked with working, treating soldiers coming back from World War II with what they then called shell shock. And so being a good Freudian, he said, well, lie down on the couch here and go ahead and talk about Omaha Beach. He later wrote in one of his books, he wrote, we found that this approach was not effective. It was harmful. He noticed that they were worse after they remembered the bad stuff in their lives, and that's re-traumatization. But if you pair that memory and that event and talk about that while you're tapping, then something happens called memory reconsolidation and emotional extinction. And that means that you now reconsolidate that memory with a neutral cue and you remove all the emotional tags of fight or flight attached to the memory. And so that's why we keep our eyes open. That's why we have this particular procedure because if you were just to tell the story, you re-traumatize yourself. If you tell the story, and you introduce the therapeutic cue of tapping, you then are able to cathartically discharge the emotion. And Tammy, I've done a lot of research that's empirical research using MRIs, EEGs, uh, cortisol, um, other genetic markers. I've done several studies using genetic tags, and I've done one study on epigenetic tags, little tiny molecules called microRNAs. And we did this with veterans, veterans with severe PTSD, flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, and a lot of disease. So in that study, we gave them 10 one-hour sessions of EFT, and we literally measured the expression of their genes before and after. And we found that a whole bunch of these microRNAs, these microRNAs attached to the genes of people who have traumatic stress. We, we see that parts of their genome that have to do with health, to do with emotional expression, to do with safety, are to shut down. And these little tags, microRNA tags, attached to the genes in stress people, and those genes remain silenced. We literally saw those microRNAs popping off the genome in this large scale randomized controlled trial of veterans. So it is literally changing you epigenetically. Okay. Now I can imagine someone saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We went from a reduction of cortisol to impacting brain waves to saying that EFT is an epigenetic intervention. Okay. So how do you measure whether or not something like tapping is affecting gene expression. You, you talked about these little, but I didn't follow it all, Dawson, to be honest. Like, what are you measuring so that you can say this is a successful epigenetic intervention? Yeah, you don't have to measure these things in every, in every patient, every client. You measure them in very, I mean, these, these are highly technical studies that are measuring things like gene expression. And uh, now what's really happened that's that's been a game changer in the last 10 years is we used to need a blood draw to measure things like cortisol and, and gene expression. Now we can do it on, on a saliva swab. So we've had these companies like 23andMe now literally having people spit in a tube, mail it off to a lab. We can extract enough genetic material from that saliva to be able to measure which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off. And about, about 85% of your genome is, is responsive to the environment. 15% is fixed, like you know, I have gray eyes and brown hair, and that's just a fixed genetic characteristic. But that's only 85% of the genome is fixed. The other, I mean, that's, I'm sorry, 15% is fixed. The other 85% is fluctuating depending on, and, and stress is, is having massive effects body-wide. Because think about it, your ancestors, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, when they were faced with a predator or a hostile environment, every single body system, organ system, had to come into play. Their muscles had to be filled up with blood and be ready for fight or flight. Their breathing would get shallow, forcing blood into their muscles for the stress response. So their hearts were pounding, their muscles were activated, their lungs were, they were breathing shallowly, all these things were happening 
a lot of it controlled by hormones, like cortisol, and by gene expression. And so we can measure these things now. It's not, not easy. It's, it's highly technical. We can measure these now, though, and we're, there are now lots of studies showing that, that, that all these things are being affected. And the, the, the problem is that while those stress responses were highly useful for my ancestor 100,000 years ago, now being highly stressed, just because I have a pimple on my chin, I mean, my, my daughter is, you know, is, is, is a grown woman. I, I adore her. I see her a lot. But what, she was staying with us a while back and um, visiting from Colorado where she lives. And Tammy, she had a pimple on her chin. And she was so stressed over the pimple on her chin. I was just laughing. It's like, I can't even see the pimple on her chin. But she's like, <laughs> feels a blemish to her whole life. So we get, and we get worried and stressed about you know, our deadlines and sure. not being the right body shape and being overweight, you know, the worry about all these things that as Mark Twain said, never happen. So um, that stress is now not our friend the way it was to our ancestors. And so we wanna really learn ways to bring it down by tapping. Okay, now you mentioned that we can impact our brain waves, our brainwave state through tapping. And you had us using our eyes to look up at a clock and down at a clock and three o'clock, nine o'clock. Tell me what's going on in terms of brain waves when I'm doing that kind of thing. It is so cool. And we've now known as we've been studying brain waves. So Hans Berger invented the EEG in 1929. And then around 1960, some advanced scientists like uh, Robert Becker and uh, Maxwell Cade began to use EEGs and look at how it was affecting, how, it was, how the brain waves of people were changing when they were calm. And they were studying meditators and they were noticing that they, they, they shift their brain waves. Also, that's, that was a great period of discovering what happens during sleep. And so we began to realize that our brains slow way down. Normally they're in beta, which is between 12 and roughly 30 cycles per second. That's the normal state of consciousness. When we go to sleep, we have this drifting down feeling and we go to alpha, which is eight to 12 cycles a second, this much slower brain wave. Finally, we drop into theta and then delta. And most of the night we spend in delta, which is zero through four cycles per second, a very, very slow brain wave. Every roughly hour, we pop into a slightly higher, faster brain wave, theta, and then we drop down into delta again. So that's the sleep rhythm, a very well understood phenomenon in psychology. What we found is that as people do these eye movements, they drop into those slow brain waves. They have more delta, more theta. And that is the time of night when we're, say, for example, when we're in deep sleep. We're usually in a very peaceful deep sleep. When we pop into theta, that's rapid eye movement sleep or dreaming sleep. We, we, our eyes move around a lot and we're in dreams. So theta is when your brain is wiring and creating new memories and new connections. Delta is when it's pruning and cutting away unused neural pathways. And so the eye movements drive the brain into theta and delta. And that's also, of course, how we process trauma and problems as we often do them do it through dreams dreaming and sleep you, you know you, you're worried about something you have a good night's sleep benjamin franklin said the best cure it, for your worries is a good night's sleep and even though that, that was 300 years ago it still really is true today and so those eye movements we found hooking people up to eegs prompt those same cycles you go through and sleep only for a few minutes but that's the brain the brain's way of making solving problems, make new neural connections, and pruning problematic ones. How would you use EFT for a good night's sleep? You can tap before you go to sleep to relax yourself. So you'll just find it's relaxing to tap. Uh, sometimes I, I just tap without any particular thought in mind just to feel relaxed. So you can tap before you go to sleep just to feel relaxed. You can tap to have good dreams. Like I visualize having good dreams while I'm tapping, so I'm calming myself. And doing the visualization, you can tap to go to sleep quickly. I, I looked at all the research into this. And for example, in our clinical trials of veterans, insomnia is a real problem for people with PTSD. And veterans in our studies had high levels of insomnia. After six one-hour sessions of EFT, their levels dropped back into the normal range. So you have increased sleep and increased sleep quality when you start tapping. 
One of the uh, interesting sections of your audio teaching series on EFT for recovery and resilience is what's going on when EFT doesn't work? So you ask that question and then you answer it. And I, I wonder if you can answer it here. Yeah. And in our, I mean, EFT is not a panacea. Nothing's a panacea. If anyone tells you that their therapy solves everything, cure it, cures everything, just run away. It's not true. No therapy is a panacea. EFT works really well for things to do with episodic memory. So it works spectacularly well with PTSD. It works less well with things that are primarily genetic or purely medical. So um, there's a range of, of, of how it works. And uh, so for, for example, in our studies, about nine out of 10 veterans recovered from PTSD, their levels dropped into the normal range. One out of 10 didn't budge. Well, but, but, but Dawson, first of all, let's just take a moment. Nine out of 10. That's Nine huge. 10. That's huge. That's, that's huge. Yeah. 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 And so what we tell doctors and nurses and medical providers is that use EFT as a frontline treatment because nine out of 10 veterans we've shown in this research respond to EFT and that's the cure. They do their six sessions or 10 sessions and they're done. But uh, one out of 10 doesn't. So what we recommend for them is intensive individual psychotherapy, group work, social support is incredibly important. If you have caring people around you, loving people around you, then you want to bring them into the healing process. And finally, on our, it's called the stepped care model. The final step is if all of that doesn't work, then you do drugs and you do intensive psychotherapy. But for, for goodness sakes, and I just want to, I, I, I'm passionate about this, Tammy. Do not do those extremely harsh drugs as your first line of treatment because they have side effects. They have really severe side effects. And so what we've been doing for the last while is we've been medicating these veterans to an extreme degree, we have we have people coming to us. We, we have another social project. We've treated over twenty two thousand veterans free of charge in the last twelve years with EFT, and we we find that many of them come into our program, and they have they're taking twelve medications or six medications. They're taking medications to control the side effects of other medications. That's not the first thing to do. The first thing to do is see how energy can change you. Meditation, consciousness, awareness, that can make a big difference and then go to your doctor with the real problem don't expect your doctor to medicate away emotional stress and your doctor will really appreciate that if you take that approach mm -hmm. so you, you mentioned uh, a six session series or a 10 session series hour long each together we did a six minute practice do you repeat that six minute practice up to an hour so do you repeat it several times or what makes up an hour long session we typically ask people to bring in lists of their problems. So they'll bring in, for example, the veterans will bring in a list of problems, also with those scores, Tammy. So they'll have the, 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 their list saying, my dad beat me so hard when I was eight years old that I, I lost consciousness, or my brother tried to drown me when I was 12, or um, I got picked, I, I didn't get picked for the football squad when I was 18, whatever it might be there, lists of those those life issues. And then some of them have to do with combat, some have to do with, with regular life. And so we work through those with veterans one by one. Now, some of these are severely traumatic, life-threatening events, and it's going to take more than six minutes to work on one. And we may have to work on what that person smelled and tasted and saw and heard as Part of a treatment session and those can take a while so small things often drop pretty quickly that's why i do pick an easy thing for the recent past if someone's been traumatized and has dozens or even hundreds of traumatic memories then it is it takes longer to work through mm -hmm. those in the audio uh, teaching series one of the things you say dawson is that eft is unique among therapeutic approaches in that it actually makes deliberate and systematic use of dissociation in the healing <laughs> process so i wonder if, if you can explain that how the technique actually uses our uh, response of dissociation to trauma in an efficacious way yeah, so trauma in, in trauma treatment in psychology generally, 
Dissociation is a real barrier to success. You need exposure. You need to think about the bad stuff and light up those neurons in your brain to treat them successfully. If the client is dissociating and not lighting up those neurons, then it's, it's hard to work with. And dissociation is normal for traumatized people early in life. If I am a child being violated, if I'm being ignored or hurt and I'm three or five or six years old, then what do I do? I just go somewhere else. I have a picture in, in, the, in, in one of my books of a, of a woman who drew the, an image when she was in therapy of what it was like to be raped repeatedly by a family member when she was young. And you see this picture of this, this little girl she drew in a corner, this giant hand reaching through her body. Up in the corner, there's a smiley face. And the smiley face is me because it was not safe to be in her body. So that's dissociation. If you're in a, if you're in a, a firefight in a foxhole, it is not safe to be there. You dissociate. And you probably dissociate when you think about it again. So dissociation is a real, a real issue. But when people are tiptoeing now into treatment and actually are willing to work on their issues a little bit, maybe, then giving them a couple of layers of safety and inducing a little bit of association allows them to gain confidence in working with those issues. So we typically start small with veterans. And then there are like we had one veteran who we were Vietnam veteran called Bob Culver. And there was a documentary about Bob and a group of other veterans we treated. And Bob said, I'll work on these issues from Vietnam, these memories from Vietnam, but not this other group of memories that are behind the wall. Those are too terrible to even think about. Now that is adaptive dissociation. Bob can't even face them. Three days later, Bob Culver was tapping away at his memories. He'd gone behind the wall and retrieved them. But we let him, we didn't make that that we didn't suggest that the first day. The first day we let him do all the dissociation he wanted while he worked on small issues and gained confidence that he could recover. Then he went eventually behind the wall. By the end of that time, he was describing a, a mortar attack on the field hospital he was at in, in Vietnam. And the therapist working with him said things like, now think about the mortar attack. And Bob's thinking about the mortar attack while tapping. The therapist then asks, and you remember the bodies of the people who were killed? And Bob says, yes. The therapist then says, how many bodies? Count them. And Bob's tapping and counting and telling us that 18 people were killed in the mortar attack. So he's doing that. That's on day three. Initially, we used association therapeutically, and Bob worked on the easy things first and then moved to the hard stuff like the mortar attack and, and, the, and the body count, after which he remained totally calm. He remembered the event, but he no longer went into the stress response. Mm -hmm. Now, in the in the audio series, Dawson, you get personal at a certain point, and you share a huge trauma that happened in your life approximately five years ago, and how everything uh, you had done prepared you to be able to go through it. And I wonder if you can tell our listeners about that. Yeah, Tammy, you know, I've been a meditator for many years. I joined an ashram when I was 15 years old and learned the perennial philosophy. And we studied Elvis Huxley and Paul Brunton and Adam Watson, all these people. But that, you know, that's that's wonderful to do that and immerse yourself in that, in that material. And yet I still faced a bunch of life's challenges in, in my life over the last many, many years. And uh, I really committed now to letting, letting people know what those those techniques are, 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 are are without going through 50 years of stumbling through figuring it all out. But um, I had to apply it myself during that, that time. And on the night of October 9th, 2017, my wife woke me up in the middle of the night, took me awake and said, something's really wrong. And I looked at the alarm clock next to my bed and it was flashing 12.45 a.m. I looked out the window, there was an orange glow on the horizon. And I went outside quickly, and there was a wildfire racing down the opposite hill toward our hill. And I just yelled at her, we're getting out of here right now. And I, I ran through the house, grabbed car keys, grabbed phone, threw on some clothes, and sprinted to the car and dro drove out just as the flames began to engulf all the trees around us. And it was... Um, 
you know, you go to an altered space at that time. I almost felt as I was watching myself from above. And I, it's funny, I it was fear and yet this absolute feeling of, of love and security and, and being protected at the same time. But it, it was devastating for, for our community. We, we lost 5,400 5, homes, were destroyed. 22 people were killed, died when their cars, when the power went out, people got stuck in their, in their, in their garages. They couldn't open the garage door. Trees fell across the, 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 some of the neighbors' driveways. Eight of our neighbors died. And so it was just a horrendous event. And it took us a long time to rebuild and recover. We had a whole bunch of health problems after that. We had a huge financial crash because our office and our business was destroyed as well. So um, we, we faced a very challenging few years. And yet we found tapping, meditation, energy therapies were, were powerful. And so in the year after that, I'd sit in meditation after the, the fire, living in a rented house and gradually piecing our lives back together, trying to rebuild our business. And I was entering these extraordinary states as I would meditate. And I, I would feel the love of the universe, Tammy, just pouring down through me. I'd feel so much love and so much compassion and so much joy that I, I was just filled with gratitude. And so I wrote the book Blitz Brain during that period because I wanted to know what, what is this? You know, how come I have so much serotonin and dopamine, these two pleasure chemicals, anandamide, oxytocin? So that book is all about those seven pl pleasure chemicals you get during deep meditation, about the brain waves that are that go along with them, about the regions of the brain that are active in people in Bliss Brain, and um, where we went from that point. And the book ends with with post-traumatic growth. And the fact is that PTSD is not inevitable, that you go through trauma and research shows that two thirds of people who go through a trauma like that actually emerge either with equilibrium or stronger. That's post-traumatic growth. And we tend to be really obsessed with PTSD. And of course, PTSD, a quarter or a third of people do actually develop PTSD, but two thirds of people develop post-traumatic growth or stabilize afterwards are resilient. And you want to learn those skills, meditation, EFT, because we use them a lot in the year after the fire. And they made, I, mean, I, I can't imagine how you could even go through uh, a, 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 an experience like that, or even, even, the, even the average disruptions of the average life without these kinds of tools to support yourself. Did you find yourself surprised, Dawson, that here you were experiencing these positive neurochemicals and writing a book like Bliss Brain uh, not that long after such a, an incredible devastation? I found it astonishing, Tammy. I mean, not, not just when you look at the, uh, the studies of the Tibetan monks that use meditation and are, are long-term meditators, and you look at markers like I, I like objective markers like how much gamma brainwave do they have in their brains and how high is their their level of uh, bliss molecule like anandamide anandamide is a very recently discovered neurotransmitter and um, its name ananda is a sanskrit word for bliss and how do you have those that anandamide in your system and how do you have those that uh, those high levels of gamma brain waves we find in research that those monks have up to 25 times the amount of gamma in their brains, not 25%, 25x the amount of gamma. That's why it's bliss brain. And you find yourself going to these extraordinary states of just being one with you all that is. And so I found myself there just day in and day out, both before the fire, I've been practicing those techniques for, for a few years, and then after as well. And I, I just got passionate about sharing this with people because people, again, like my daughter's pimple on her chin, you know, they, they have some little issue to deal with and they and, and they, they, they just feel their lives being wrecked. Like, you know, we just had this hugely um, annoying and um, a triggering event where the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And I, I mean, people I know and <laughs> everyone I know is pretty much... I mean, the degree of, 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 of anger and, and frustration and disappointment about that in, in much of, of, 
of American society, whether you're on the right or on the left, is enormous. And so I heard one friend of mine saying, I heard the news and I was devastated, I was wrecked. Well, be disappointed and feel the emotion and then do something to rescue yourself. Don't be in that state of being wrecked all the time because it's going to drive your cortisol high and hurt your body. We need these tools, Tammy. And that's why I'm so passionate about advocating meditation, grounding. I mean, there's so many wonderful things we can do. Anything body-based that brings that experience of the infinite into our bodies is going to produce a, a, a rapid shift in the world around us. Can you explain to me, Dawson, how in being a meditator and connecting to this infinite space that changes the actual neurochemicals that are being elicited in our brain and in our body? How does, how does that create that change? When you meditate effectively, now in this brain, I shot a really clear light in terms of research into what is effective meditation. And the unfortunate truth, Tammy, is that much of what people think of as meditation, like when I was in the ashram at 15, the meditation master said, oh, just close your eyes and still your mind. It's like, well, I can do number one. I can close my eyes. Stilling my mind? I've been doing this for 50 years. I still can't still my mind. I can still my mind if I was at gunpoint in order to still my mind. I, I, you know, I, I, minds just aren't meant to be still. Our, our brains evolve to look around them all the time at the environment, and it's just our crystal mind is, is, is almost impossible. So um, you, what you can do is do physiological cues. So in this brain, I, I give people cues like tapping will calm you down, like relaxing your tongue on the floor of your mouth will stimulate the vagus nerve to send a calming signal throughout your body. And so I, I, I give people seven evidence-based techniques like that that really work to bring you into those states. A lot of what people are doing, thinking it's meditation, like um, we had one of our, our team members while I was writing this brain, he lived with his girlfriend and she was a meditator, a long time meditator, meditated an hour every day. And so um, he would, in the morning, wake up, get ready for work. This is before the pandemic, going to the office and he would be very careful not to disturb her. But one day, he made a little too much noise and she opened her eyes in the middle of her meditation and glared at him and said, don't mess with my fucking serenity. Was she meditating? Probably not. And that's what's going on with most people. They think they're meditating when they close their eyes, but you've got to do things that are effective. And so with this brain, I try to look at the science of what's really effective. And there are a few things that are hyper effective, but the saffron robes confer no special uh, gift to you. The 108 prayer beads are doing nothing whatsoever for your, your well-being. You gotta focus on science. That's why I love science. Science is showing us what really works and what really doesn't. So when we meditate, we we if people are meditating effectively, we watch their whole central nervous system is going into parasympathetic mode. Their sympathetic fight or flight response is dramatically down leveling, and the nerves that spread out from the spinal column into all the organs, your bladder, your tear ducts, your lungs, your, your heart, everything is being affected by that movement. So meditation is, is, is getting into the this, this state of physical calm, sending, needle, sending a signal through the vagus nerve to calm everything in your body. Then it triggers those brain waves, again, those both slow waves of theta and delta, and also that fast wave of gamma, which is the brain wave of integration, integration, creativity. Uh, and it also lights up the part of the brain that has to do with compassion. Compassion meditation is one of the three things you can do in meditation that will dramatically shift brain activity. And we watch in MRI studies how when these meditators move into compassion, the whole lobe of the brain that handles positive emotion, gratitude, happiness, awe, joy, all of those things, those are the emotional phenomena that happen. But what happens is that that lobe of the brain, it's called the insula, becomes highly active in meditators. So it's triggering those, those feel-good neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And those are the same neurotransmitters that are a part of the reward system 
that is stimulated by, by heroin and cocaine. So we're getting these wonderful feelings of pleasure from the reward, reward neurochemicals. We're getting oxytocin, lots and lots of oxytocin. So when you hear St. Teresa of Avila talking about the beloved or hear Rumi or Hafiz talking about meditation and oneness with you all it is in erotic or, or relationship terms, it's because they are having orgasmic experiences driven by oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, and anandamide. So I have a profile in my book, This Brain, of, of the neurochemicals of meditation and the neurochemicals of orgasm, and they're pretty much an exact match. So all these people are having these orgiastically wonderful experiences. They're also highly addicting, which is why when people hit the mark and able, are able to meditate once or twice effectively, they tend to do it again. So we can measure the effects of meditation in all these many dimensions of the human brain and body. Mm -hmm. In the audio series you've created with Sounds True, Healing the Roots of Trauma, EFT for Recovery and Resilience, you offer several different meditative practices. You introduce something you called eco meditation. You teach uh, not just the EFT technique and various applications, but also some integrative meditative experiences. And I wonder yes. here at the end of this conversation, Dawson, <laughs> can you uh, leave us not just with that terrific laugh of yours that uh, always uh, comes shining through, but can we have a, a type of integrative meditation together here as, as we end? Something, some way to help us settle with everything we've heard. We do another type of the full meditation that is composed of several, seven actually, evidence-based techniques that dramatically calm the body. And let's just do one little of technique right now, which affects the vagus nerve. So think of something that annoys you something different from the previous thing. So something recent that annoys you, maybe a person, maybe a name of a person, maybe uh, an image, maybe a thought or a belief, but that makes you feel a little bit annoyed, maybe a little bit angry, resentful, uh, blaming, shaming, any negative emotion. And now relax your tongue on the floor of your mouth. So let your tongue just fall on the floor of your mouth. Normally our tongues are tense and often against the roof of our mouths. This is the opposite place. Let them fall to the floor of our mouths. And now, keeping your tongue totally relaxed, try and get upset about that thing. Just try. But keep your tongue relaxed. Try getting upset. <laughs> and you can't. And you can't because what's happening is that when you relax your tongue on the floor of your mouth, it sends a signal through your vagus nerve all over your body that you're safe. And you can't then easily get upset. So try it in traffic. Try it when you're stuck in a long line or have a long wait or have a disturbing meeting. Just relax your tongue. And eco meditation builds together seven of those techniques, and you put them together in one package. You go into this deep, deeply relaxed state, and you don't just fill your mind. You're able to function in that usual human way. Your mind can be as active or as still as you want it to be, but you're doing these seven things that really send that signal of safety to your body. Wonderful. Dawson, what a great tip to, li to live people with. Wonderful. I've been speaking with Dawson Church. He's the author of Bliss Brain. He's the founder and CEO of the EFT Universe. And with Sounds True, he's recorded a new audio learning series. It's called Healing the Roots of Trauma, EFT for Recovery and Resilience. Sounds True, waking up the world. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at resources.soundstrue.com backslash podcast. That's resources.soundstrue.com slash podcast. If you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I absolutely love getting your feedback and being connected. Sounds true. Waking up the world. <laughs>